Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to study the parasha, parasha Nitzavim. And I want to look at some verses here, a couple of verses, which are some of the most well-known verses in the, in the entire Torah portion. And I want to look at chapter 30, verses 11 through 14, with a real emphasis on verse 12. And I want to connect this which, with a story that's typically connected to these verse, but also show how it also connects to our Dafyomi, to a story from our Dafyomi. So, and try to understand what's going on here. So chapter 30, verse 11, I'll just read the three verses. Ki mitzvah azos. This mitzvah, asher anochi mitzvah hayom, and I'm commanding you today, it's not far away from you. It's not something that's wondrous to you. Meaning to say, it's all there in front of you. It's not distant from you. What is this mitzvah that we're talking about? Nachmanani says it's the mitzvah of repentance. But Rashi says it is the mitzvah of Torah study. Torah study. Rashi says we're referring to the mitzvah of Torah study. A Torah nas nawachem rash says the Torah was given to you. Bihsavu balpe, written in oral. So we're according to Rashi, we're the assumptions we're talking about Torah study. Loba Shamaimi, this this mitzvah of, of studying the Torah is not in the heavens. Saying, who, who amongst us can go up to the heavens and vi and take it down for us? And and teach it to us, Pinasana will do it. It's not on the other side of the Jordan River saying, or other side of the sea saying, who can go for us and cross over the sea? Be Kachelanu and take it for us. In verse 14, this matter is so close to you. This matter is so close to you, it's in your mouth and in your heart to do it. So the verse that's most talked about here is the verse that says that the Torah is not in heaven. The Torah is not in heaven. First, I'll share some Talmudic teachings about it, and then I'll share the most um, well-known Talmudic story about it. It's not in heaven. Why do we mean when we say that the Torah is not in heaven? In Gemara and Erevin, 55a, he says, If the Torah be in heaven, there would be no excuse. Even if it was in heaven, you'd have to go. Oh, you'd have to go up to heaven to get it. If it was over the sea, you'd have to cross the sea to get it. Another approach to it in Gemara and Erevin. What does it mean when it says the Torah is not in heaven? What do we mean by that? That the Torah is not in heaven. By the way. Uh, I just want to say this one is for April because it says it's not in heaven saying who will go up to heaven for it. So if you look at those letters, Balaturim says that the first letter of those four words spells out Mila, circumcision. And if someone rejects the circumcision, they can't go into heaven. That's what the Balturim says. But the Gemara and Erevin gives us a different explanation. The Gemara and Erevin tells us, Lo timtza, you won't find the Torah, b'mi shemagbiyah dato alah. You won't find the Torah in somebody who is arrogant, like, like high up like the heaven. And Rabbi Yochanan says you won't find it in the haughty. So at first glance, it seems that these two approaches are exactly the same. So, and that they're just saying in different, different expo- explanations. Um, but it's possible that there's a distinction between them. Torah Tamim tries to draw a distinction um, that, that the first one is talking about uh, somebody who's arrogant specifically about theological points of view. 
Whereas the other one is talking about arrogance, just in general arrogance. And then we go, a third approach is Rabbi Yehuda Mashmuel, who says in the Gemara in Temura 16a, there were 3,000 halachot, shloshet alafim halachot, 3,000 halachot, nishtachu bimei avlo shamosha. There were 3,000 halachot that were forgotten during the days of mourning of Moses. Amruel Yoshua. They said to Joshua, Sha'al. They said to Joshua, go and ask, ask the heaven for these laws. Because what happened was after Moshe died, they were mourning. And when you're mourning, you're grieving. And so they forgot the 3,000 halachot. So they said to Joshua, go ask the heavens. Ask him to replenish us. And Joshua said, Joshua said, I can't do that. The Torah is not in heaven. I can't do it. So you can't bring a proof from the fact that Moses got it because Moses got everything from the heaven. But now once the Torah was given to us, we can't go back to heaven for the answers. We can't run to mommy and ask her to help us. We can't run to Hashem Yisbarach. We have to find out halachot by ourselves. This explanation of wo he meaning we can't go to heaven to get it, this is most famously told in the following story from Baba Metziah. 59A, bottom of 59A and 59B. So I want to read it. By the way, I want to say that we have the big merit to use now in the yeshiva. We got a shas. And the Rebbe, the Lavach Rebbe said that the souls of the people who use the shas are in the shas. And this shas was a gift to the, to, in 1965 from Rabbi Moshe Weiss, the father of Rabbi Avi Weiss, to, to Rabbi Moshe Weiss's son-in-law, Walter Rech. And Walter was kind enough and Walter and Tova were kind enough to donate it to the yeshiva. So the Gemara on the bottom of Bamatsia 59a discusses if you have um, if you have a if you have a type of oven that they're discussing a type of oven that was called so let's say you have an oven that there were like different sections of it and you put clay between each section, is it considered one oven? And thereby, if it becomes ritually impure, the whole oven can never be fixed because it's a pottery utensil, it will always be tame. Or do we say that no, that since it's all separated by this, you, the clay, it's considered to be separate pieces. Do we view it as one piece or not? A technical point. Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer said, it is, okay. Rabbi Eliezer said, it's not Tamei, it's Tahor. He says, it's all, it's all unique pieces of earth. And the Chachamim say, no, we're going, uh, we're going to assume that this is one large unit and therefore it becomes to me. So Eliezer was very upset. So what happened at that point? Eliezer goes, and now we're on the top of 59b. The Talmud says, this is called the Tanur of Achnai. What's Achnai? Rashi tells us that this is like a snake that wraps itself in a circle to stick its tail by its mouth. The Talmud says, what's achnai? That they surrounded him with words, like this snake. And they said, it's Tamei. On that day, says the Talmud, but also ayom, heishib Rabbi Eliezer. On that day, Rabbi Eliezer responded to their argument. They said, it's Tamei. Rabbi Eliezer says, I'm convinced it's Tahor. It's ritually pure. Rabbi Eliezer responds to them, Kol tshuvo olam. He brought back to them all the answers in the world. He proved he's right. He says, I'm 100% correct. They say, we don't care. You know how frustrating that must be for him? He was sure he was right. They said, we don't care. Amar he said to them, Im kamosi, he said, if the law is like me, charuv ze yochiach. Let this carob tree prove that I'm correct. The carob tree was uprooted from its place by 100 amot. 
uh, you know, 150 feet, and some say 400 amot. They said to him, we don't take proofs from a carob tree. Sorry. Carob trees can't prove this matter for us. Chazav Amrlam, he said to them, if the law is like me, let the stream of water prove it. The stream of water that was falling near where they were studying began to flow backwards. They said, that has nothing to do with us. Don't bring me a proof from a stream of water. He said to them, he said to them, if the law is like me, let the walls of the temple prove that, of the, of the Beit Midrash, let the walls of the base Midrash prove that I'm correct. The walls of the base Midrash, the walls of the yeshiva began to lean in and look as though they were about to fall. All of a sudden, Rabbi Yoshua stood up and Rabbi Yoshua rebuked the walls. He said, He said, if the Torah scholars are, are arguing with each other in matters of halacha, he said, he said as follows, he said, He said, he said, what do you have to do with this? Isn't that your fight? These are we're Torah scholars debating each other. Stay out of this. It's nothing to do with you. At that moment. At that moment, the walls didn't know what to do. Well, they didn't fall. They didn't fall because they didn't want to disrespect Rabbi Yoshua. They wanted to honor him. But they didn't become straight because of the great honor for Rabbi Eliezer. If you go there to this day, you'll see that the walls are still inclined. <laughs> they're, 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 on an inc- they're on an incline. They're partially falling. <laughs> so... So then, what did they do? I've read this passage so many times, each time I still love it. So Chazar Amr Lahem, he went back and he said to them, if the law is like me, let the heavens prove it. Let the heavens prove it. Okay, at that moment, what did he do? Heavenly voice went out and said, our verse, our verse, the, the heavenly voice went out and said, Malacham Eitzel Rabbi Eliezer. He says, what does this have to do with you? Why are you starting up with Rabbi Eliezer? Shalacha komosa b'kol makom. The law is always like him. Amad Rabbi Yeshua Ragov. Rabbi Yeshua stood on his feet and he said, our verse, lo ba'ashem ha'imhi. It's not in heaven. What does that mean? What does it mean, lo ba'ashem ha'imhi? What does it mean it's not in heaven? Amad Rabbi Yermia. Shekvar nasna Torah me'ar Sinai. The Torah was given at Mount Sinai. And so therefore, We don't listen to a heavenly voice anymore. Shekvar kasafta me'ar Sinai. It says at Mount Sinai, that we follow the majority. So we have to follow the rules of the Torah. And the Torah told us that we follow the majority. And so therefore, for that reason, we're not following. We're not following your teaching that we that the, the heavenly voice was. You gave us the laws at Sinai. The laws at Sinai say we follow the majority, and the majority voted against Rabbi Eliezer. So Ashkei Rabbi Nasan Eliyahu, Rabbi Nasan found Elijah the prophet. Amar Le, Rabbi Nasan said to him, "My Avik Kuchah Bricha Biyahi Shaita." He says at that moment. What was God doing? What was God doing at that moment? And he says, He was laughing and he was saying, My children have defeated me. My children have defeated me. So, so, so that's the passage, a very, very, um, often quoted passage uh, that God has given us the Torah and now we don't pay attention to heavenly voices anymore. And the Torah was given at Sinai and that's based upon the verse from our portion, the Torah is not in heaven. But there is a contradiction to that, a little bit of a contradiction based upon our Gemara. 
our Gemara that we did in the Daf Yomi today. What does the Gemara say? Let me cite this passage. The passage states 77b. The Talmud talks about a terrible disease which they had in those days. And my, I described it to my wife and she connected it. She said there's a very, this is exactly like a neurological a neurological condition, but I of course forgot it. But anyway, there forgot the exact name. But the, uh, the so there was a disease that was very, very dangerous and it was called Rasan. And what's the, what happens if you have Rasan? These are the consequences. If you have the Rasan condition, you have this terrible illness and the Talmud on today's daf, Yomi Ksuvos 77, by the way, a very mystical number, 77, relates to 770 of the, of the Rebbe. And seven and a half years ago on this daf was the, when Rav Aaron Luchtenstein, uh, Zechard Tzadik Levracha, passed away. So this was his daf, and it's all about the angel of death. we will see in a moment. Anyway, says the Gemara, what are the conditions, the symptoms of somebody who has Rasan? So he says as follows. My Simani, what are the conditions of someone with Rasan? His dolphin uh, ain't his eyes are droopy, his nose is runny, and he has spit coming out of his mouth, and the flies are always flying around him. So, how do you heal such a person? So as a baye, you bring this concoction of herbs and, and uh, you boil them together. And then what you do is you pour them on, you take them into a house, which is not drafty. And then you pour this concoction on his head and soften up his skull. And then you open up his skull and you find the parasite in there. You take out this parasite uh, and then you very carefully take it out and you burn it. And that's how you get rid of this condition, the surgery, they do brain surgery, to get rid of this condition called Rasan. Rabbi, Yos, Rabbi Yochanan, and now the Talmud tells us how all these rabbis would be so careful about this medical condition, so careful because they felt that it was very, very contagious. So Rabbi Yochanan would make a proclamation. Be very careful even from the fl flies that are around the person who has Rasan, because those flies carry diseases. You can get sick from it. And it's very powerful to read this Gemara. Last time I read it was before COVID. Now we see that a lot of the quarantining happened during COVID. But the, so these rabbis are also uh, concerned about contagious diseases. Rabbi Zera did not sit downwind from a person who had Rasan. Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer didn't go into the tent of somebody with Rasan. Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi didn't eat from the eggs of a neighborhood which had this Rasan condition. Rabbi Z, uh, so, but that's what all these rabbis did. Comes along Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, and Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, what did he, what did he do, says the Talmud? Michrach bahu. He, he, he became closer to them, the Asik Torah. He attached himself to them. He wrapped himself in them. And he studied Torah with them. He said, the Torah gives off favor and grace. If the Torah is able to give grace to those who study it, surely it could provide protection to them. When... It came time for Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. So Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi said, you know, he was like the people who would go into the houses of the people who had AIDS when the early days when people didn't know how it was transmitted. He was like Rabbi Arye Levine, the tzaddik of Jerusalem, who would go into the leper colonies and treat the people. But he would treat them not with medicine, but with lifting them up spiritually by studying Torah. When it came time for Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi to die, they said, up in heaven, they said to the angel of death, I'm Elayla Malcha go and uh, do, do him a favor, ask him how he wants to, ask him how he wants to die. So Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, 
when the angel of death arrived, he said, all I ask for is that you show me my place in heaven. He said, just show me my place in the Garden of Eden. Not heaven, in the Garden of Eden. So, he's, the angel of death said, okay, you got it. He says, first, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says to him, let me have your knife. I'm afraid you're going to attack me on the road. You're scaring me. So he goes, okay, that's legitimate. He says, give me your, uh, he gave him his knife. When they came to the Garden of Eden, he said, when they came to the, uh, when they came to the, the Garden of Eden, he said, he picks him up, the angel of death, helps Rabbi Shubham Levi up so Rabbi Shubham Levi could see his place over the wall. But what did Rabbi Shubham Levi do? He quickly jumped, jumped over to the other side of the wall. The angel of death grabs a hold of Rabbi Shubham Levi's cloak. It says in the Talmud, Nakta Bekarna de Glime. He grabs a hold of his coat. Rabbi Shubham Levi says, I swear that I'm not going to go back to the other side. He said, I swear. Not going back to the other side. Well, he said, God looked up in heaven and said, if God gets involved, he said, if he's never had to revoke a vow, then we're not going to revoke this one. But if in his life he revoked vows, we'll revoke this vow too. So clearly he had not ever revoked a vow. So then the angel of death said, give me back my knife. Give me back my knife says, I don't want to give it to him. And this is the part which connects to our portion and to the first story I told. All of a sudden, a heavenly voice came out and said, give him back his knife because he needs it to kill the people. So at that moment, the Talmud doesn't say explicitly, but it seems very clear that he gave him back his, his knife, he gave him back his knife. And here we have a contradiction. Why did, Re, why did Rabbi Yoshua in the Talmud, in the story in Bamitzia, it's a different Rabbi Yoshua, but why did he say to the heavenly voice, butt out, not your business. But here Rabbi Yoshua and Levi listened to him and gave back the knife. We'll come back to that, that's the question. What's the difference between the two stories? But first, I might as well tell you the end of the story so that you know what happened. Rabbi Shimon Levi comes into heaven, he sees Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai sitting on 13 golden chairs. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, who are you? He says, I'm Bar Levi. I'm, uh, I'm the son, I'm son of Levi, I'm Rabbi Shimon Levi. So he said, Shimon Bar Yochai said, was there ever a rainbow seed in your lifetime? And he said, yes, even though there wasn't. A rainbow was a sign that God intended to destroy the world, but he was keeping his covenant. That means, that, not every, that there wasn't a right, truly righteous person in the generation. Rabbi Shubham Levi said there was a rainbow. Even though there wasn't, he was just being modest. So Rabbi Shubham, so Rabbi Shubham Baruch Hai said, if there was a rainbow, then you're not Rabbi Shubham Levi. Anyway, the Talmud has a second story which it attaches to it, to the story of Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa. And it's really one long story because you hear the difference between the stories. I'm just going to read a few as well. Hanina Bar Papa, he was also friends with the angel of death. And when he died, they also sent, they said to the angel of death, do a favor for him too, help him out. You know, meaning to say, give him a nice death. So the angel of death shows up and, and Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa says, give me another 30 days. Try 30 days. He says, give me another 30 days. So after 30 days, he said, He, show, he said to him, show me where I'm going to be in the Garden of Eden. Show me my place in the world to come. So the angel of death said, okay. Then he said, give me your knife. Oh, sorry, I, I missed an important part. He said, give me 30 days so I can review my Torah study. So, because it says, fortunate is the one who comes to heaven with his Torah study in his hand. After 30 days, the angel of death came back and he says, now show me my place in the Garden of Eden. He says, give me your knife. Maybe you're going to scare me. And this time the angel of death said, no way. 
I'm not going to do for you like I did for, I'm not falling for this trick again, like, like your friend Rabbi Shubh and Levi did. So, so, so Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa says, show me if there's any verse I didn't keep in the Torah. And he says to him, did you take care of the people with Rasa? Did you take care of the people who had this medical condition? And, he's, and he didn't. So he said, he didn't do it. So when he died, still, even though he wasn't as holy as Rabbi Shulman Levi, because he didn't take care of the Rasa on people, when he died, there was a pillar of fire between him and everybody else. Now this pillar of fire separated his coffin from everybody else. That was a sign of his greatness because it only happened to the most special person of the generation. So another rabbi came close to the pillar of, of fire and he says, I beg of you to get rid of this pillar of fire, he's speaking to the dead man, because it's, it's disrespectful to the other rabbis because they don't have it. He didn't listen. He said, it's disrespectful to your father. He didn't have it. He didn't listen said, well, we won't be able to take care of you. We won't be able to bury you. So he got rid of the Torah of fire. Anyway, this is the story. And the reason why I, I brought both stories is that you see that the difference in the story of, of the oven of Achnai, we listened to the heavenly voice. And we said, the law is not like Rabbi Eliezer. The, Rabbi Eliezer was an iconoclast. He was all on his own. But here in this story, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, listens to the heavenly voice. In that story, in the first story, we don't listen to the heavenly voice. The law is like the rabbis against the heavenly voice. Here in this story, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi listens to the heavenly voice. So there are a lot of reasons why there's a difference between the two stories. First of all, one story was all of the rabbis saying a law and the heavenly voice was saying against it. So then heavenly voice is overruled. But in this case, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi was a lone rabbi trying to duel with the angel of death. So if you're by yourself, you have no choice but to listen to the angel, of, to the heavenly voice. You can't argue against it. A second major difference is that Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, when he was being spoken to, he was in heaven. He was in the Garden of Eden. He couldn't say the Torah is not in heaven. He was in heaven. So, so therefore, he was bound by the laws of heaven, not by the laws of of not by the laws of the Torah anymore. So therefore he had to listen. But most fundamentally, the most powerful part of the story to me is the difference between Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi and Rabbi Hanina bar Papa. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, he was the one, he was the only one in the entire Talmud who goes into the Garden of Eden while he's alive. And there's no other person. He was given this special merit. Now, really, why do we care that he's there alive? Everybody's alive in the Garden of Eden. So what does it matter that he didn't die? It's just showing us that he was the greatest. And he had this special, he was so special. He was even greater than Rabbi Shun Bar Yachai, who had 13 chairs. And what made him so great? That all of his Torah study was to help other people. In contrast, Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa, he says, give me 30 days so I can review the Torah by myself. His Torah was, was not an outward Torah. His Torah was inward, helping him review his own Torah study so he could come to, the Torah, come to God with the Torah study in his hand. That's the fundamental difference between Rabbi Shubham Levi and Rabbi Bar Papa. That's why Rabbi Bar Papa is not allowed into the Garden of Eden while he's alive. And he, ultimately, he wasn't allowed in. He, he we didn't get the knife of the angel of death. He was on a lower level. And that's the whole point of us, that if we, the whole point of this is the Torah is not in heaven, the Torah is for us. But the whole concept of the Torah is to help other people, to give spiritual lifting to people who are in need, to people who are struggling, like this Bali Rasan. And if we do that, then the Torah is this powerful force. Otherwise, if we don't do that, God forbid, then... Then the, then the Torah becomes just for us and just becomes a fire separating ourselves from other people. So let me just pause for a second and see if anybody has any questions.